Hey, Dr. Darko, where do you go to get your life and disability insurance? I went to Set for Life Insurance. They helped me save over 30% compared to my previous policy. Wow, I'm paying an arm and a leg for my life and disability insurance. What's that company called again? Set for Life Insurance. Check them out at setforlifeinsurance.com and tell them Dr. Darko sent you. Welcome to Doc's Outside the Box Podcast. This is your official show, looking inside the minds of cutting edge and innovative doctors. Think you'll find these stories in any medical textbook? Sorry, you're getting real live insight from men and women pushing the envelope beyond medicine. Ordinary doctors doing extraordinary things. Let's start now with your host, Dr. Nee Darko. Hey docs, are you looking to learn how to become a physician leader? Then Physician CEO is for you. Physician CEO is an accelerated business immersion program designed for physicians and developed by MBA faculty from the Kellogg School of Management at Northwestern University. So learn more at www.physician-ceo.com forward slash D-O-T-B. What's up? What's good? This is Dr. Nee, the doc outside the box. Thanks for joining me on this episode. This is going to be a little bit different. We're not going to be doing a pure interview on this episode. We're going to be doing a little bit more of an educational talk on specialty websites blogging from a specialty standpoint and from a branding standpoint and what it can mean for your practice as well as your own brand. My next guest is Dr. Percy Francisco Morales, also known as Dr. A. Fib. Yep, it's short for Dr. Atrial Fibrillation. And as you can tell by his name, he is a cardiologist. He's an electrophysiologist and he's based out of Houston, Texas. And about a year ago, he started his blog called Dr. A. Fib. And on this blog, he gives educational tips for patients with atrial fibrillation. Now, after a year, he's been able to review the results, and he's noticed that it has been extremely beneficial to his patients, but it has also been really beneficial for him. It's really helped to increase his reach far beyond the city limits of Houston. And he strongly believes that doing this type of website, having this type of branding on the website, has been a great opportunity for him and also serves to be a great opportunity for you all out there. And it's a way not just to advertise to patients, but let's be honest, it's a way to kind of grow your significant following. It's a way to create your own branding, get more media recognition, as well as speaking opportunities, all as a way to help you get more patients in the door, as well as get more visibility, even with referring doctors. So I bought Dr. Morales, Dr. AFib onto my show, and we're going to talk about all of these different things. You're going to learn a lot from him. And he's also going to share some of the tips, even some of the tricks, and even his equipment and setup that he uses for his YouTube videos. Now, before we get into this episode, I want to quickly say, please make sure you share this episode with others. And also make sure you show some love to all the physician podcasters out there. Every day, more and more are springing up. Check the physician podcasters directory on my website at drneedarko.com. Just go to podcast and then go to podcast listings and you can find physician podcasters who are podcasting on various topics from personal finance to business uh, to even lifestyle. Check it out. You're going to have a good time there. And without further ado, I present Dr. A. Fib. Dr. Percy Francisco Morales, welcome to Docs Outside the Box. What's good? Hey, Neat. Thanks for having me on the show. I'm a fan of the show. I listen to it all the time. Thank you for having me on. I appreciate it. No, no. We're excited to have you on the show because one, first of all, I need to say, also known as Dr. A. Fib, I feel like you should be in a cape as well as a mask. (laughs) (laughs) So I'm really, really excited with what you're doing from a social media standpoint, from a website standpoint, because I think That is a weakness that a lot of physicians have. That's not our expertise. And to see what you've been able to do with that has been really impressive. So having you on the show is going to be great. So you can teach us all about specialty websites for our audience. Sure. I'm happy to do that. So you are currently a practicing cardiologist out of H-Town, as I like to say, but obviously from Houston, Texas. Yeah. So I've actually been here in Houston for about 13 years now. I'm originally from Chicago, born and raised. Went to medical school at Washington University in St. Louis, which is a great school, uh, great teachers over there. But as a surgeon, you could probably relate to this. You know, I did my medical school general surgery rotation in the months of December, January, and February. And there was a lot of scraping ice off my car and scraping snow off my car early in the morning. So when it came time for my internship and residency, I went ahead and pretty much only applied to stuff in the South. 
pretty much every place I interviewed in was how I said, I am done with snow and cold at this after doing a month of my general surgery rotations as a medical student. And so I ended up matching over at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, Texas for my residency. I ended up staying the whole time. I stayed for my cardiology training, my electrophysiology training. And then eventually when I was done, I ended up doing private practice in the Houston suburbs where I'm now there for over five years now. Talk about that transition from being a private practice physician to, you know, creating your own persona as Dr. AFib. Like, tell us about the back end about all this. What happened with that? Well, you know, the story actually, it starts about a little over a year ago now. I've actually been doing Dr. AFib. And just to let your audience know, Dr. AFib is my online social media platform. Uh, And I started it about a year ago now. I specialize in electrophysiology and particularly have managed a lot of patients with atrial fibrillation over the years now. And starting about a year ago now, I really started to, you know, have a little bit of some symptoms of burnout in a sense, you know, and many years training and going through residency and then fellowship. And then, you know, you get out and you kind of see all the things that people talk about when they talk about burnout, the whole system of medicine, the corporate side of medicine. And, you know, you really kind of start realizing in a sense like, well, you know, is this the only way that being a doctor is in 2018? Is the only way to do it? You know, the way I'm basically told how to do it? Is there other ways that I can reach people and educate people and use this knowledge that I trained for many years now and apply it in a different way? And so starting about a year ago, I started being like, is there something else that I can be doing? Is there another way to apply this you know, knowledge, all these years of training and the way that I manage patients with atrial fibrillation and create something new and unique with it, you know? And I started thinking, you know, there's got to be a different way to apply it, you know? And so actually, when I first started deciding to do Dr. AFib, my actually inspiration was actually nothing in the world of medicine. I actually, at that point in time, didn't know this side of the world of people, doctors doing podcasts and side gigs, and I wasn't really aware of it at that time. Most of my inspiration came from people who do either travel blogs or finance blogs, you know, and I saw them and I followed them and I thought, you know, these people use their knowledge and they, they created something that was very successful and created the business of it, you know, and I thought, well, you know, is there any reason why I don't do this or can do this, you know, is, can I use my medical expertise and actually create a blog and create a following and create something that could be potentially beneficial for patients as well as something that can help me kind of grow my own career. And so that's when I started coming up with this idea and I wanted to give it a catchy name. And so I'm Dr. AFib, something that people would immediately recognize. When it comes to atrial fibrillation, you know, I get a lot of the same questions all the time. And I know when my patients have a lot of the same questions, I know a lot of people out there have a lot of the same questions. So I started blogging about it just about a year ago now. Yeah, that's pretty smart, actually, because every commercial you see on TV now is talking about something related to AFib, you know, those pharmaceutical commercials, Mm -hmm. you know, so to have that name and be branded as that, I think was a really smart move. And, you know, it's really interesting that you mentioned that your inspiration were people outside of medicine, because I have the same type of story with docs outside the box. Like Mm -hmm. I was in a situation where, you know, I'm trying to pay off all the student loan debt, didn't discover the white coat investor yet. But was listening to different podcasts, different YouTube channels on people paying off debt and just started slowly discovering what people were doing online with social media, vlogs, podcasting, mm-hmm. all those yeah. things. And then next, you know, you see what other people are doing on YouTube. You see what people are doing on podcasting. You start to look at your own topic. It sounds like we had the mm-hmm. same type of thought process. Like you start yep. seeing what people are doing with their own topics. You're like, huh, if nobody's doing this with my topic, maybe I can do it, Right. Yes. Um, exactly. So that was a really smart move. And when you mentioned that, I was like, man, we're kind of like kindred spirits in that realm. But what about like going to create Dr. AFib? You know, once you see that other people are doing something similar, did you ever get any feelings of like, man, like, I'm not sure if I should really be doing this? You know, this is what a doctor should be doing. Did you ever have those type of thoughts in your mind? Obviously, before I actually started doing this, you know, you have reservations. You kind of wonder, is it okay for a doctor to blog about medicine? Like, how do you do it in a way that is safe or not crossing any laws or we're worrying about things like liability. And that's because the first thing I ever did before I ever published any video, I found a local Houston lawyer that specialized in healthcare law and I kind of talked to him. I'm glad you're bringing that up because I was going to ask you about that liability and how do you absolve Mm -hmm. yourself from that. So tell us about that. What did you do? 
So one of the first steps that we did was one, he helped me create a disclaimer, you know, something that was from day one, I had it on the disclaimer on my website that says, you know, this is educational information only. This is not practice in medicine, does not create a patient physician relationship. Please always discuss with your own doctor. And that's been on there for day one. And now that Dr. H is actually getting bigger, I'm actually like, okay, it needs to be absolutely everywhere. And every single thing that I say, you know, and so I'm actually making that disclaimer bigger now that the doctor the whole project is getting bigger. Also, what I did before I ever started anything is I, you know, I had my employment contract reviewed. You know, I wanted to make sure that you know, Dr. Fib is my own little kind of side project. And I just wanted to make sure that there wasn't anything that was going to conflict with my clinical job as well. So I kind of took my very careful legal steps before I actually really ventured on into this project. You know, that's a really good point because some people don't actually read their contract and they don't actually understand that depending on what you have in your contract, the money or the fame or things that you, mm-hmm. you know, may get with Dr. AFib may actually be owned by your practice or by your hospital. I know some people who've actually gone through that. They obviously are not on the level as you are. You know, they were on a lot smaller scale, but a lot of people don't understand this. That was really a smart move. I love this, man. Keep it going. Keep it yeah, going. no, I mean, I don't work in academics, but I've even heard things from academic standpoints, like intellectual property, you know, like if you're working under a university and you come up with a new idea, the intellectual property may belong to the university, you know? And so obviously from the get-go, before I really started working on this, I wanted to make sure that this is something that I could do and that it was something that I could grow and, you know, would belong to me. You know, I think the most interesting thing though, is that you realized also that I'm sure the majority or soon a very large majority of your patients will be using their cell phones or online, you know, avenues to really educate themselves or to learn about you. So it's really amazing that you jump in front of that. But Obviously, you went to school for a dozen years to educate yourself to be a master on the human body. How did you start that process of like teaching yourself how to do YouTube or even how to do websites? Because that can be really daunting. Yeah, it all went in steps. I actually originally started on Facebook because Facebook is, I think, an easy social media platform to kind of get started on. You know, the page is very structured. It's just kind of like, They have you areas where you put your title and your picture and you kind of create content. And it was kind of an easier way to start off. For me, I actually started off pretty much exclusively with video blogs. I kind of did these very short video blogs. And, you know, patients tend to ask a lot of the same questions about atrial fibrillation. And the good thing about, you know, discussing atrial fibrillation as far as a platform for social media that it involves so many different topics. I mean, from medications to procedures to lifestyles, alcohol, tobacco, sleep, all these different lifestyle errors. And so I would do these short video blogs that were usually two to four minutes long. And that's where I got started posting those on Facebook. And you kind of learn a little bit about what are the right tags and what are people you know asking to look for. At the very beginning, you know, it was actually kind of challenging and took some practice, you know, I'm sure you probably went through this experience with your podcasting in the sense that, you know, the first few videos, I look at them back now and I'm like, oh my goodness, they were pretty rough, you know? Oh yeah, I've been there. I can't even stand to listen to my first episode. Yeah, exactly. You know, I look at that and it's basically my video blogs are just me in a room by myself looking at a camera and trying to get talk to somebody like I'm in the office talking to a patient, but I'm really just by myself in front of a camera. And so learning how to make something where I'm a little bit more, you know, energetic, more engaged, you know, to the camera stuff to make something that somebody wants to watch. That took a little bit of practice, but then certainly over time, I got much better with that. And as it kind of grew on Facebook, that was sort of my first experiment to see like, okay, do people actually want to look at what I have to say? Or do they want to actually listen to me? Is there a market for this? And once I started realizing, okay, there are a lot of people, a lot of questions about atrial fibrillation. People are really listening to this and learning about this. And so now it's time to take a further step. And that's when I started doing an actual website as well. The actual design and website, I've always had help. You know, I don't really think I want to spend a whole lot of time learning how to create the actual website platform. Um, So I've had people help me from the get-go. But uh, once it was kind of set up, then I kind of learned a little bit myself about the actual process, about you know making videos and also increasing having written blogs so that the search engines can kind of pick up the topic so that more people can come and view it on my websites. That's something that I think a lot of people are getting a little bit nervous about nowadays is the SEO, search engine optimization. Do you know much about that? Can you speak on that at all? Or is that something that you kind of leave to your webmaster? 
I learned a lot of it myself. I think that anybody who does like a medical website, you know, really needs to know some of it themselves. I mean, certainly I don't think none of us have enough time to become expert in SEO, but you know, when too, it also, you can make everything more productive because you're also watching what your webmaster, what your other person who's in charge can help what they're doing. And so as far as, let's say for a medical topic like atrial fibrillation, you know, you can actually quickly Google and say like, what are the most common questions that people have for AFib? And then start making videos about what are the most commonly asked questions. You know, I, for example, like I don't necessarily talk that much in my clinical practice about stress in AFib or anxiety in AFib, but that's a very common search term. I mean, many people are Googling about anxiety and stress and how it affects their age fibrillation. So I've made several videos about that because I have recognized that that's something that people are searching about. And so, but when it comes to search engines, definitely want to have as much written as possible. Even though I have a lot of videos, you know, the videos other than the title, you know, the Google can't really pick up all the things that are in, in the video. So you got to have a lot of descriptions. You got to have mix it with written blogs as well. So certainly as I've gotten a website and the website's starting to grow, I've tried to add more written blogs. Any doctor who manages whatever health condition you want to think of, you already know all the questions. And, you know, that's the thing. I mean, for you as a surgeon and for me as an electrophysiologist, we've heard the same questions hundreds and hundreds of times. So the content that you want to put in there is already in your head. It's just a matter of how you want to put it and making sure that it's written in such a way that it matches what people are commonly searching on the Internet. So, Dr. Percy, I know we were talking about creating websites in your specialty for doctors, but what about doctors who are looking to brand themselves, maybe want to become like professional coaches, want to be on TV, kind of want to take things in a non-clinical fashion? Do you have any advice from a website standpoint or even from a branding standpoint for them? Well, I think that the whole branding side of things, I found it to be very beneficial to me and can be beneficial to many doctors out there. You know, we kind of talked a little bit earlier about you know, frustration with healthcare and big business taking over, you know, and these big businesses, they are experts in marketing and branding, you know, and creating your own brand is something that can finally actually benefit the doctor and benefit your own career. Okay. And there's many ways that they can go about it. I mean, many doctors create a brand, just use their own name, creating a whole social media platform, talking about a a wide variety of topics. You know, there's a lot of doctors out there talking about burnout or women in medicine or other healthcare topics. And then there's a growing number of people talking about actual medical topics as well. So what it does is it increases your exposure, both kind of more of a bigger, broader picture, like nationally, which may turn into television opportunity, but also increases things locally as well. From my perspective, you know, even just before Dr. Fib, you know, once it started growing, even in a, from a local standpoint, people in my area of town, you know, they've already, I've made sure that all the referring docs and everybody around the area know that what I'm doing and to refer, you know, to, if you have a patient with AFib, you know, you should send them to me. And so that's sort of brand name recognition that helps people to kind of hopefully increase referrals to me. And I have seen that from patients that seeing me online, but also referring doctors just recognizing, okay, this is a guy who is very knowledgeable about atrial fibrillation. So it definitely has shown plenty of improvement from that standpoint. And as far as the name goes, you know, many people go by, you know, just their professional, you know, the regular Dr. Morales or so, you know, for their branding, which is great. And I think it's very helpful. But honestly, I really think that my catch name of Dr. AFib has actually been pretty useful for as far as growth and growing the brand as well. So I think a catchy name is also very useful. I think it really helps people recognize who you are. Now, I looked at your videos. Your videos are really good. Do you do your videos by yourself or do you have someone help you with that? No, I do all the videos by myself. How much time does it take? Now that I've been doing them for a while, it actually doesn't really take me as long. I do them all in one take now, you know, for the most part. I kind of realize that people don't really care that much if you make a very small slip up. You know, most there may be a small slip up in my video. You know, most of the time it's one take and that's all it is. I do them in my kid's playroom. And, uh, you know, as time got, went along, I actually started using a green screen as well. It's been about six to eight months now I started using a green screen. And what that allows me to do is, one, I can pretty much make the video seem like I'm anywhere. You know, it's not necessarily in my kid's playroom. And also the AFibs, for example, can have a lot of technical 
parts to it difficult to understand, you know, and so I can put slides behind me or if I'm talking about a trial that supports what I'm trying to say, I feel a little snapshot of the trial, you know, summary behind me so that people can kind of see that, you know, what I'm trying to say has some actual backing to it. But it took a lot of practice in terms of the videos as well. You know, I had to kind of learn that lighting is very important to make a good quality video. And so it took a lot of practice in trying to the different video editing softwares until I kind of finally feel I'm pretty comfortable with the way that my videos are these days. Mm, I love it. I love the fact that you do it in your children's uh, <laughs> room because it really goes to the fact you really try to make as much use of space as possible and also highlight just how we are now with technology, right? It doesn't matter where you are. As long as you have some great information, you can really do whatever you can do with the background. I mean, mm-hmm. look at us having this conversation right now. Like, I'm in, you know, another part of where I normally live. I'm in New Jersey in my parents' basement having this conversation with you. You know, it's it's impressive. You know, tell me, like, you know, we talked a lot about, you know, the positives and even some of the do's that you should do with with creating an online presence, particularly from a web standpoint, video standpoint. Let's talk about some of the negatives. Can you tell us some of the negatives that are associated with this, if you know any, or even some of the don'ts that you would recommend other doctors follow? I think that from a medical website standpoint, I'd probably say the bigger challenges, I wouldn't say it would be negatives or don'ts, is kind of how to interact or engage with an audience. You know, I really think that doing a medical website like this would grow a lot faster if people feel that they can ask me a question about their AFib and then I'll answer it back. And I've really had to try to figure out what's the right way to do that because you could easily think like if somebody asked me a question about AFib and I answered their question back, well, well are you practicing medicine on social media? Are That's you what I'm medical thinking. advice? You know? That's what so, I was thinking. So I want to know, how do you handle So that? how do I do that? You know, so I, you know, and obviously when it comes to these social media platforms, engagement is actually such a good thing for growth and getting more views. And so how do I make that happen? And that's been a very challenging part. You know, I don't know how many times I've had to respond to people on social media and say, I'm sorry, please discuss with your doctor. But one of the things I started doing pretty recently, which I think has been the best idea in terms of trying to engage with people is that, you know, I'll create some preview posting. Usually I do it on my uh, Dr. Fit Facebook group. I'll do a preview posting about 24 hours before I do a live event. And so I say, you know, what are your questions about AFib? Post them here. And then the next day I'll do my live event. But literally the first thing I say is like, all my answers here are educational, informational. Please discuss with your doctor for making any changes. And then I go ahead and I answer those questions. And so that's kind of been the best way that I have thought of to kind of really engage and talk to people about a medical topic and trying to protect myself as legally best as possible. And now, a word from our sponsor. Understanding how to run a business in medicine will put you at a unique advantage in the future. Whether it's leading a hospital, practice, or starting a new venture, the Physician CEO program will put you in focus from day one. Physician CEO is an accelerated business immersion program developed by MBA faculty from the Kellogg School of Management at Northwestern University. The Physician CEO program provides an intensive MBA-style education made up of modules, with each module covering topics from leadership, to entrepreneurial ventures. Because of their individualized structure, each participant leaves the program with their one, three, and even five-year business plan, all designed to function in the real world. If you're a physician who is looking to start your own venture, lead your practice or department, or even start planning for succession out of medicine, then you can't afford to miss this opportunity. Class is filling up. Learn more at www.physician-ceo.com forward slash D-O-T-B. I love it. That really makes a lot of sense. Now, what I want to know is what's the next step for you? Like you've conquered YouTube. You are doing well from a website standpoint. Any chance you may may be taking this to a podcasting medium (laughs) or anything else? What's next? I haven't thought about that as far as a podcast yet. I mean, maybe the thoughts crossed my mind here or there, but as far as what to do next, I mean, I honestly want to just keep growing my platform. Far from say that I've succeeded in YouTube, you know, there's certainly a lot more room to grow there. I want the website to grow as well. You know, I obviously want to hopefully grow to the point where I get more ads and sponsors on there, you know, while, when the visibility increases. And, you know, possibly considering that some paid content as well. I've had thoughts about different ways to kind of have a comprehensive, you know, information about atrial fibrillation. I think that every patient should know from A to Z. And I keep debating whether to start an ebook or do a video course. And so I haven't quite 
you know, started that venture, you know, but I'm, that's sort of what my next project would be, like something that's comprehensive instead of a short, you know, little blog. My advice is, I don't know if you saw my head moving up there. I would definitely do an ebook. I mm-hmm. definitely recommend that from your standpoint. I think people want to eat up that information and if they can, you know, read it either on their computer or on their cell phone and that be associated with you, I think that's the way to go. Yeah, I've actually thought about that a lot. And, you know, and what's something to consider is that, at least in my audience, part of any doctor who does a website, you got to know who your audience is. You know, and patients with atrial fibrillation tend to be older. You know, they tend to be 60s, 70s or so. And are they going to be really interested in video content versus written content? You know, as time has gone along, I'm actually currently more seeing more growth in my written content than as far as than video views. And I think, I don't know if that has to do with anything with, SEO getting better and Google's just recognizing all the stuff on my website versus just the demographics of the people who are interested in, in this type of information. Yes, it's very interesting to see how this goes. I mean, but even from a technology standpoint, Facebook is starting to trend older now, right? Because, mm-hmm. yeah. you know, people are putting their pictures up. People want to connect with their children or they want to connect with their grandchildren. So mm-hmm. you're getting an older demographic coming yep. on Facebook. So, you know, like you said, written, they read it, obviously. And Obviously, they're looking at video also, but that may be a great way to reach that demographic. You know, this is really a fascinating discussion. I really like your perspective on all of this. And I'm really glad that we have you on the show talking about this. So we're getting towards the end of the interview. And I want to kind of throw some quick, fast fire questions at you. You game? Okay, yeah, I'm ready. Ready ready to do this? (laughs) Hopefully it doesn't give you AFib with these questions. (laughs) I'm ready. All right. So if we can parse down this interview to kind of one important thing that you want people to walk away with, what's the most important thing that podcast listeners should grab from this podcast? I think that any doctor, no matter what specialty you're in, can benefit from having your own website and your own brand. I mean, there is a lack of a doctor's voice out there in the internet. Educate patients and treat patients. Name whatever health condition that you specialize in. And there's a lot of room for growth out there. There's a lot of space for a doctor to add their own personal insight. And it can be beneficial and educational to patients, but it also can be beneficial for doctors in their careers as well. So obviously, as a surgeon, I recognize that cardiologist, EP, extremely busy field and juggling multiple things. Mm-hmm. You know, so between that, being a husband, a father, physician, Dr. AFib, give us a life hack that you're doing right now or that you're using that helps you balance all of this stuff. I guess to compartmentalize everything, for the most part, do Dr. AFib stuff early in the morning, like before I ever even start work, usually between 5.30 and 7 in the morning is usually when I do most of my Dr. AFib work. Then I have my clinical job after that. And in the evening time, I try to just do only family stuff, spend my only time with the family. So I try to really keep things separate. You know, this is my time to work on this, this is my time to work on that, and this is my time with my family for the most part. I love it. Look, is there anyone that you admire, anybody who inspires you that you wouldn't mind trading places with for 24 hours? I don't know. How about Need Darko? I'll trade, I'll trade spots with you. You sure you want this life? I don't think you want that. <laughs> I don't know if you yeah. want this life. But <laughs> well, you know, the reason why I answered that, I couldn't really think of any other answer. You know, I think that, you know, honestly, as far as my whole life goes, my medical career, and even just doing Dr. A. Fib, I've kind of always feel like I've been forging my own path and trying to create something that's new or different, unique. And I've not really had a whole lot of examples out there to say, like, I want to be like that guy. You know, I just kind of feel like I've always been forging my own path. No, I really love that answer because it's true, right? Like you are being the best Dr. Morales that you can be, right? And hopefully when we all leave this earth, you know, people will be able to look at us individually and say, okay, this person contributed this to the physician field and um, have helped, you know, transition us from like, kind of like this old dogmatic, Mm -hmm. This is the way in which you have to practice medicine to something that really is, I guess we're trying to figure it out right now, right? Right, exactly. Um, I appreciate that. It's like literally like you are your own model, I guess, so to speak. What's a successful habit that you're using makes you more of a doc outside the box or even more successful? I guess just kind of learning about all the different software and equipment, you know, that need to be able to do this. You know, it's easy to say, okay, we're going to make a video and post on social media, but you got to learn the right equipment from the camcorders to the lighting to the video editing software and all these kind of additional stuff together. And once you kind of get used to it, you kind of become more efficient. That's why it doesn't really take me too much time to make new videos these days. So the learning curve is definitely lessened for you. Yeah, no, for by far. The first couple of videos, I probably spent hours just editing it. Now it takes me like five minutes to edit it and post it. 
if you had an opportunity to go back and see yourself as a pre-med or even as a medical student, what kind of advice would you have given yourself? As far as the medical career, the, the career path that I've taken, I've overall been pretty happy with. You know, great that we have so many financial resources for physicians nowadays. Like, But I've often thought like, if I could go back and give myself some advice or give medical school advice, it'd be financial advice. You know, it's not only about like student loans, but also the lifestyle and like all the things that you could be doing to have a better life for yourself that, you know, all the lavish overspending that a lot of doctors do that kind of affects a path towards financial independence, you know, and I frequently think that if I had known more about that when I was a medical student or a resident fellow, my financial situation is much improved now after several years of being in practice, but where would I be if I didn't have to make up for all of that stuff when I was younger? That's a really good point. Really good point. So I want you to finish this. I asked this question to all my guests. Okay. It's hashtag, I'm not just a doc. I'm a... I'm not just a doc. I'm an influencer. And to be honest, about six months ago, eight months ago, that would have been kind of hard for me to say. I kind of naturally don't want to sound boastful or brackful of myself. But as and you probably have seen this through growing your podcast is that when you want people to see that you have something special and you want to grow, you have to show it to people, you know, and so I'm an influencer. You know, it's really good. Let's actually, let's spend some time on that because I think that people suffer from imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm. I think people suffer from a whole bunch of different things that they may not want to talk about, but it may limit them in terms of being able to say what you just said, which is an influence, mm -hmm. which yeah. we all are, right? In right. some form or fashion, we are trying to kind of get ahead of the game and trying to help other people kind of come with us. Mm -hmm. I do think that we're at a tipping point now, or we may have even passed that tipping point where people are, one, a lot more comfortable saying that they enjoy taking care of their patients, but they also love themselves also, and they right. mm -hmm. have the life that they can have. And two, you know, there's this hope that eventually they can kind of emulate this lifestyle that other people would want to aspire to also. And to just kind of share that, I think is really great. So Dr. Percy Morales, man, thank you so much for coming on the show. This was really great. I think we are all going to learn a lot from you in terms of, you know, how to basically have online presence from whether it's from Facebook, YouTube, as well as from a web standpoint, how to standardize everything and also how to help improve, you know, just our social standing with mm -hmm. our patients. So thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you, Neil. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me on the show.